Coming up on our newscast tonight. The hotly anticipated Winter Games in South Korea begins with a two-hour-long opening ceremony today. Olympians from 92 participating nations are gathered in one venue to mark the occasion. North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jung arrives in Seoul, becoming the first member of the regime's ruling family to visit the nation. Anticipation builds as to what kind of message she brings amidst the reconciliatory inter-Korean mood. President Moon Jae-in continues to hold meetings with visiting VIPs. Today's list includes the Prime Minister of Netherlands and Japan, as well as the UN chief. New Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, coming to you live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. The curtain rises for the 23rd Winter Games right here in South Korea tonight. The opening ceremony in Pyeongchang has started at 8 p.m. local time. It's the second time the Olympic cauldron is lit in the nation, the first being three decades ago at the 1988 Summer Games in Seoul. Our EG1 is standing by for us at the Olympic Plaza in the host city. G1, it must be pandemonium over there. Daniel, the long-awaited Pyeongchang Winter Olympics have finally kicked off with the grand opening ceremony uh, held, uh, beginning just a few minutes ago, uh, just a minute ago behind me at the Pyeongchang Olympic Plaza. There is loud music and bright lights everywhere in this normally quiet town. The excitement down at the plaza on this historic day was real and many friends and families have come from all over the world to witness this international sporting festival held in South Korea. We're so excited to be here tonight. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, so amazed. USA! USA! Thank you. From USA, from Australia, from Italy. We're so excited about the Winter Games. It's not even that cold out. It's going to be a lot of fun. I was surprised because I thought there would be mostly Koreans coming. But I think most of the people here are foreigners. And it's like we're receiving energy from all around the world. So I think it's really enthusiastic. Uh, we came to the Olympics because we thought we wanted to witness history and we think that we're witnessing history right now. Um, this will be the last family trip that my family makes before I and my, bro uh, my, my brother and I leave, leave for college. So really excited for this opportunity. To tell you more about today's opening ceremony, it's going to unfold with the journey of five children searching for answers to peace, featuring Korean legends and history, as well as a flurry of performances that will showcase South Korea's rich culture. The two Koreas marching in together will be another moment to remember. After all the other 90 participating countries enter the plaza, Team Korea will come in under the unification flag with the Korean folk song Arirang in the background. There will be two torch bear, uh, sorry, flag bearers, one from each side, Bob Sledder Won Yun Jong from the south and the women's ice hockey player Hwang Chung Gum from the north. The ceremony will also have a large VIP audience with President Moon Jae-in, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in attendance, as well as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's sister Kim Yo-jong. And Chiwon, of course, the excitement will peak when the Olympic cauldron is lit. And uh, could you tell us about what's uh, been kept under wraps? Oh, it looks like we have some technical difficulties at the moment, so we'll have more updates on the opening ceremony in our later newscast. We'll move on to our next story. Now, for some athletes in Pyeongchang, their Olympics have already begun even before the official opening ceremony. Kim Hyesung has the results of the preliminaries of various events thus far. The opening ceremony officially kicked off the 23rd Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, but the competition already started on Thursday with the preliminary rounds in various categories including curling and figure skating. Mixed double curling contested for the first time at these games has been in the spotlight in particular. The South Korean team of Lee Gi-jong and Chang Hye-ji routed the U.S. 9-1 on Friday, setting their second win at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. 
This win follows a defeat of 3-8 against Norway and gives South Korea a total of two wins and two losses, ranking fifth on the table. The Zhang Li duo is scheduled to face Olympics athletes from Russia and Switzerland in mixed double matches Saturday. Another highly anticipated category is figure skating, which already heated up the ice rink with short programs of men's singles and pairs. 17-year-old figure skating rising star Cha Jun Hwan debuted on Friday in the men's singles to finish sixth out of 10 skaters with a season best of 77.7 points. Freestyle mogul skiing for men and women also held preliminary games Friday with more rounds lined up throughout the weekend. Kim hye Arirang News. Meanwhile, President Moon Jae-in hosted a pre-event to welcome the many world leaders in his country for the Games. The possibility of a get-together between leaders and key officials of Seoul, Washington, Tokyo and Pyongyang tracked much spotlight. But did it really happen? Our Moon gon joins us live from the nation's top office. Gon-young, what's the latest? Well, Daniel, the uh, opening ceremony of the 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games is getting underway on a rather uncomfortable diplomatic note at least. South Korean President Moon Jae-in hosted a welcoming reception for his top guests uh, that ended right before the opening ceremony opened. And uh, we are hearing that at the event tonight was, was an absence of U.S. VP Mike Pence. Now, on the guest list were many world leaders in the country for the PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games, including... Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, and North Korea's nominal head of state Kim Jong-nam. What we know thus far is that the event got delayed by 40 minutes as the Japanese Prime Minister and the U.S. Vice President didn't appear on time for President Moon's uh, receiving event and the photo session. So the event got underway without the two, and the South Korean leader had to step out of the dinner reception for a separate photo opportunity with Mr. Abe and Mr. Pence, uh, after which the Japanese Prime Minister joined the crowd and seated himself at the head table. But the USVP went in, shook hands with those at the head table, but not with North Korea's Kim, and left the premise without seating himself for dinner. Now, global media attention had been focused on, on the possibility of the first face-to-face -face between North Korea's ceremonial leader or head of state and U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, but that obviously did not happen, intentionally avoided by Pence. Daniel. All right, Kanyang. North Korean leader's influential sister Kim Yo Jong, however, uh, was never on the guest list and was not at the pre-opening ceremony. So, are we expecting any contact between President Moon Jae-in and Kim Yo Jong? Well, absolutely, Daniel. So while Kim Yo-jong, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's influential sister, uh, did not attend the reception earlier this evening, South Korean President Moon Jae-in has said he will host a luncheon for the, the sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and the rest of the high-level officials from North Korea traveling to the South for the PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games. Now, sources say that an informal luncheon of that sort will give Kim Yo-jong more freedom to interact with the South Koreans instead of one main speaker taking the center stage. Hosting an informal luncheon for the high-level North Korean delegation avoids really any protocol format where the only one main speaker has a voice, and that main speaker would normally be Kim Jong-nam, the head of uh, the delegation and North Korea's ceremonial head of state. But in this case, uh, what the younger sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has to say will take much more significance and meaning. Um, and meaning, that is, both sides had maintained a delicate balance so as not to disrupt or upset any kind of, um, any kind of diplomatic efforts that could overshadow the uh, Winter Olympics. That obviously uh, is not turning out to be too successful thus far. Daniel. All right, Kanyang, we appreciate the updates. We hope uh, some positive developments will unfold from here on. Now, before attending the opening ceremony of the PyeongChang Winter Games, President Moon Jae-in will meet with several high-ranking foreign guests, as our Kanyang also covered. Hwang Woo-jin fills us in on the Liberal leader's Olympic diplomacy schedule. It was an extremely busy day for the South Korean president on Friday as he held separate one-on-ones with world leaders. President Moon met with his Japanese counterpart, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, on Friday afternoon. With that, he had met with all the delegates and heads of state from the four key powers in the region, minus Russia, since he'd met with U.S. Vice President Mike Pence and Chinese Special Envoy Han Zheng just the day before. 
During the meeting, the two leaders also exchanged their views on a hot potato, the controversial agreement to settle Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. That agreement, made under former President Park Geun-hye, was meant to settle the issue finally and irreversibly in exchange for around 9 million U.S. dollars. Abe said the agreement was made between two nations and that the Korean government must adhere to it in line with international principles even though South Korea's leadership has changed. President Moon in return asserted that the agreement cannot be accepted by either the victims themselves or the Korean people. He had said late last year that the agreement was fundamentally flawed. With opinions differing on the issue, President Moon still expresses gratitude for Abe's visit to South Korea and called for joint efforts by both Seoul and Tokyo for the two countries to become, quote, true friends. Shortly afterwards, the South Korean president met with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte. The two leaders exchanged views on how to boost their bilateral relations. Earlier in the day, President Moon held a luncheon meeting with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. President Moon said the atmosphere in terms of inter-Korean relations has changed dramatically since his visit to New York for the UN General Assembly and expressed his gratitude for UN's efforts to ease the tension on the peninsula. The UN Secretary General in return said that while the Olympic Games are important, the real reason he visited South Korea was to express his solidarity with the South Korean people, who have achieved the most outstanding success since the Second World War. The Blue House also confirmed that the two leaders agreed that efforts should be made to ensure that the momentum for dialogue built up during the Pyeongchang Olympics needs to lead to dialogue between Washington and Pyongyang to ultimately resolve the North Korea nuclear issue. Hong Wo-jun, Arirang News. Once again, we apologize for being abruptly disconnected due to technical difficulties, but we're going to make up for it right now by reconnecting to our Lee Won, who has been standing by at the Olympic Plaza in the host city of Pyeongchang. Now, Ji Won, good to have you back with us. Uh, let's pick up where we left off, the Olympic Cauldron Lighting Ceremony. That is the highlight. That's when we have the crescendo of the whole opening ceremony. I know it's been kept under secrecy for too long. Do we have any details about how it might unfold? Daniel, the lighting of the Olympic cauldron is still very much being kept under wraps. We still don't know who the final torchbearer lighting up the Olympic cauldron will be. The word is uh, legendary figure skating Kim hyun will be the final torchbearer. She is also one of the delegates who brought the Olympic flame from Greece to South Korea. But there could be a surprise. The two Koreas have lit the cauldron together back at the 2002 Asian Games in Busan. Uh, now, today's lighting of the Olympic cauldron wraps up the 101-day-long journey of the torch, which has been carried around South Korea for a total distance of 2,018 kilometers by 7,500 people. Now, that's all from me for now, but I'll be updating you with the latest Olympic Olympics news right from the host cities of Pyeongchang and Gangneung throughout the Games. Back to you, Daniel. All right, thank you for being out there for us, Chiwon. Do stay warm. Now, speculation and anticipation mounts regarding the possibility of an inter-Korean summit or high-level talks during the Olympic season. Reflecting on past meetings is one good way of finding out what to expect if such events do take place. Our Cha Sang-mi help us look back at the noteworthy inter-Korean exchanges. The year 2000, the first ever inter-Korean summit since the Korean War takes place in Pyongyang. Then South Korean President Kim Dae-jung and then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il shake hands and signed the June 15th joint declaration. The two leaders pledged to consolidate mutual trust and promised economic cooperation in various fields. The declaration led to numbers of separated families and relatives from the two Koreas meeting twice the same year and to Kim Dae-jung being awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Seven years later, the second summit takes place. This time between Kim Jong-il and the next South Korean president, Roh Moo-yeon, a former democracy activist. An historic moment took place when President Roh became the first South Korean leader to cross the heavily fortified demilitarized zone on foot, hoping for a, quote, peace settlement together with economic development. 
The three-day summit in Pyongyang led to the two leaders vowing to end the armistice agreement signed in 1953 and forge a permanent peace treaty between the two Koreas. Eleven years have passed since, but now a third inter-Korean summit may possibly happen during the Winter Olympics, with the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister Kim Yo-jong joining the Olympics VIP guest list. Yet some experts say any bilateral summit is merely a formality. What people are getting wrong about the inter-Korean summit is that they are not the most essential thing. The bottom line for the South Korean government is to bring the North to the table to talk about nuclear disarmament, denuclearization. Mere formality or not, if a summit does take place, it will be a historic moment. Cha sang Arirang News. One Winter Games event that's grabbing a lot of attention in the nation is women's ice hockey. Seoul and Pyongyang are competing as one. But this isn't the first inter-Korean team-up. Park Yoo-jun shows us what other sporting celebrations in the past the two Koreas have marched together or competed under the same flag. A highly symbolic moment at Pyeongchang 2018. The two Koreas marching under one Korean flag, showing an undivided Korean peninsula for the first time in 12 years. But it's not the only time that athletes from the two Koreas have marched side by side. The 1991 World Table Tennis Championships in Chiba, Japan. The Korean unification flag was used for the first time when athletes from the two Koreas fielded joint teams at the championships in April 1991. With just around a month of training, the women's joint team went all the way to the finals and won the gold medal, defeating the mighty Chinese team. The same year at the 1991 FIFA World Youth Championship in Portugal, the Korea sent a unified soccer team that ended up reaching the quarterfinals. Then, during the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, Australia, the two Koreas marched together under a united flag for the first time at the opening and closing ceremonies of the Sydney Games. It marked the first time athletes from South and North had marched together at the Olympics since the 1945 division. South and North Korea were together again for the opening and closing ceremonies of the 2002 Asian Games in Busan, South Korea. It was the second appearance of the unification flag and the first time North Korea sent their army of beauties, the same cheerleading squad rooting for the two Koreas during the Pyeongchang Games. They continued to march side by side at the 2004 Summer Olympics in Athens, Greece, and the 2006 Winter Olympics in Torino, Italy, although they competed as separate teams. Due to a shift in inter-Korean relations, however, the joint Olympic entrances went on a hiatus right up until this year. And today, the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea, never have the two Koreas competed under a joint flag during the Winter Games. Regardless of whether this will be a successful breakthrough for diplomatic ties, the Pyeongchang Winter Games will be remembered as a development where the South and North came together as one for the first time in over a decade. Park Ki-jun, Arirang News. Nearly upstaging the Olympic opener and closing ceremonies was a rare show put up by visiting artists from up north. Over 150,000 South Koreans applied for a chance to grab the very limited number of tickets available via lottery. Our Won jong turns the spotlight to the performances. An audience of more than 550 people were treated to a unique performance by a North Korean art troupe on the eve of the opening of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in the city of Gangneung. The lucky audience members were randomly selected from a pool of nearly 40,000 people who previously applied for a ticket to watch the troops' first performance in South Korea. I felt sense of cultural similarity regardless of its difference between the two nations, and the overall performance was well structured. Although we had a lot of expectations, we really enjoyed the show. We could see that they prepared a lot for this performance. But at the same time, I wish this was just not a one-off thing for the Olympics. I wish the two countries exchanged more after the Olympics. The 140-member strong art troupe, otherwise known as the Samjian Band and led by Hyun song arrived in South Korea on February 6. The band is comprised of more than 50 elite musicians known for their diverse repertoire, which even includes songs from U.S. animated movies like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King. Thursday's show at Gangneung Art Center featured popular songs by household South Korean artists such as Lee Sun-hee and Shim Soo-bong. 
They sang songs which were familiar for us to sing along. I was impressed by Choi Jin Hee's Maze of Love, Arirang, and Everybody Cha Cha Cha. Another widely anticipated performance was that of the so called Borambung Band, a group of talented musicians and all female singers who are known for their colorful performances and are often compared to South Korean K pop girl bands. This marks the first time since 2002 the Pyongyang sent an art troupe to South Korea. It is also the largest North Korean artistic delegation to ever perform on the South Korean stage. Meanwhile, nearly 300 conservative activists held a rally in front of the Gangneung Art Center, some four hours prior the performance. The protest ended without incident. Next for the Northwest Art Troupe, a trip to Seoul to perform at the National Theater of Korea on Sunday evening just one day after the joint women's ice hockey team's historic first match against Switzerland. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News, Gangneung. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, who is in Korea to lead the American delegation at the Olympics, visited a memorial site for sailors killed by North Korean attacks at sea. He also met with defectors of the regime to hear their stories and highlight the communist state's human rights abuses. Kwon jang has more from the VP's stopover ahead of the Global Games. Before heading to Pyeongchang, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence stopped by a memorial site in Pyeongtaek to pay tribute to South Korean sailors killed by North Korean attacks at sea over the years. During his visit, he hosted a meeting with a group of North Korean defectors, as well as Fred Warmbier, the father of the U.S. student Otto, who died last year shortly after being released from captivity by the regime. After Warmbier Sr. gave a warm embrace to one of the defectors, both of whom were at President Trump's State of the Union address last month, they all sat down to talk about their experiences with the North Korean regime. My wife and I wanted the honor of a meeting with men and women. Uh, who fled the tyranny of North Korea, to hear your stories uh, and today to make sure that the world hears your stories as well. I was in a political prison for 28 years without knowing why. I survived, but when I tried to escape, I was caught and sold to China. I was forced to work in a restaurant for three years and seven months before I tried to escape to South Korea. I had tried to defect previously, but I was caught. While torturing me, they told me that I had disgraced the North Korean leader and that a cripple like me should die. That's when I gained the will to escape again, and I traveled 10,000 kilometers on crutches to come to South Korea. This schedule is being seen as a conscious effort by Washington to counter North Korea's charm offensive at these Olympics and to remind the world of the regime's atrocities. Pence said before he came to Korea that he will not allow North Korean propaganda to hijack the message of the Olympics. The vice president then made his way to Pyeongchang, where observers are watching closely whether he will have any interactions with the North Korean delegation. Although both Washington and Pyongyang say they have made no plans to meet, Pence himself and other White House officials have said they will see what happens. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. On the eve of the Winter Olympics opening, North Korea forged ahead with a military parade. Through the event, the regime once again tried to present itself as a strong military power, showing off some key hardware. But according to our defense correspondent Oh Jung-hee, it was smaller in scale than shorter than usual. North Korea confidently showcased some of the key missiles that led the regime to declare the completion of its nuclear weapons program earlier this year. The solid fuel engine missile Pukguksong-2, intermediate range Hwasong-12, and intercontinental ballistic missiles Hwasong-14 and Hwasong-15 were on display. Today's military parade will show North Korea's advancement as a strong international military power. The North also unveiled an upgraded version of its KN-02 short-range missile. Its range is expected to be between 300 and 500 kilometers. It can strike the U.S., but we still need to pay attention to it. 
because it can target some of the main military facilities in Seoul or nearby area. But was the regime mindful of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics down in South Korea? The parade was only half the length of the previous one in April 2017 and was not broadcast live. The regime's leader Kim Jong-un also abstained from using provocative expressions against the United States, making no mention of nuclear weapons. I think what Pyongyang is pursuing the most at this point is improving inter-Korean relations without having any talks on denuclearization. For that, the North didn't design the parade to be as hostile to South Korea or the U.S. Experts and government sources say that such a downscaled parade is because North Korea is paying attention to the Olympics' truce, especially as its athletes, cheerleaders and a high-level delegation including Kim Jong-un's sister will be in South Korea for the Olympics, which officially starts the day after the parade. Woo Jung-hee, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories now, South Korea and Switzerland agreed on a three-year bilateral currency swap deal. The Bank of Korea announced its governor, Lee ju yeol will sign an agreement with his counterpart from the Swiss National Bank in Zurich on February 20th. This will allow the two central banks to purchase and repurchase up to 10.6 billion U.S. dollars worth of Korean won and Swiss francs. Pundits say the deal is expected to enhance financial market stability in the nation by boosting Korea's liquidity in the event of an economic crisis. Time to turn to Michelle back at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, the long-awaited opening ceremony of the Olympics has finally begun. What kind of weather are we experiencing right now over there? Daniel, thankfully, the daytime high was bearable, reaching positive territory. But as soon as the sun went down, the negative readings are dominate, dominating again. And the temperature inside the stadium will linger between minus 5 and minus 2 degrees Celsius under cloudy conditions. But the wind chill factor is going to make it feel like minus 10 degrees. Meanwhile, snow is in the forecast between midnight and tomorrow morning. Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, Chungcheong-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces will receive less than 1 cm of snow. Seoul wakes up tomorrow at 1 degree Celsius, while Daegu and Busan wakes up to milder conditions. And the nation can expect bright and warmer afternoon as well, Seoul reaching 2 3 degrees, while Gwangju and Busan gets up to 7 and 8 degrees respectively. On Sunday, temperature will plunge again to minus 10 degrees, but they will bounce back to the seasonal average levels by Tuesday. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That's all from us. To all the Olympians competing in the weekends, best of luck wherever you may be tuning in from. Thank you for watching.